Welcome, um, welcome to a, what I think is the fourth of these Indian Future Symposiums um, organized by the Ever Trust. Um, I'm David Rudlin, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm actually chair of the Ever Trust. Um, I've worked with Nick, have worked with Nick for more than 30 years through Urbed, as was. Um, I'm now Director of Urban Design at BDP. Um, so I'm going to be your chair for this afternoon. And um, you haven't got programs, so I'm just going to tell you what's, what, what exciting things you have coming up this afternoon. Um, so in a moment, I'm going to introduce Nick, although I can't see where's Nick gone. He's not. <laughs> He's left the premises. Nick has disappeared. Nick will hopefully reappear. Um, when, 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 when I stop talking. But Nick is going to start by giving a little bit of background to um, the Abed Trust work in India. Um, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> thought you'd disappear. Um, and, 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 talk, and give you a little bit of background. We're then going to um, uh, move on to Maxim Relton, um, who's an artist, um, who's going to then talk about uh, her, um, her experience of India, her, um, her uh, sketching tours of India, and is going to, through that process, introduce Charles, who's director of SCAD. And we're very pleased to have Charles here um, in the UK. Um, it's really the reasons we built this event around Charles's visit to the UK. And Charles is gonna talk about the work of SCAD and talk about the work of, of SCAD in, in relation to um, the Sustainable Development Centre and the work that he's been doing NEC over a number of years. Um, then we've got Sonia is gonna follow up from Arabs. We're then going to have a brief break. It's great to see. We, we weren't sure we had tea and coffee, but we do, which is good. So we've got a brief break um, to have another fill up of, of tea and coffee. And then that's over there. It's over here. Yeah. Yeah. It's over here. Yes. Okay. I, I'm looking at it over there, so I'm assuming that's what... That's the tea. That's the toilet. Oh, the, okay. The toilet is this way, yes. <laughs> um, after the break, we've then got Brian Love, David, um, Brian Love um, looking at Connecticut Cities, um, David Milner um, from the um, from Craig Streets, um, Savini from um, the Princess Foundation, and um, Roxana from uh, Connected City. So all of whom are talking about what they do, but also the connection of that work to India. Um, so it's a really good and interesting and full program. And in order to keep the program, I'm going to invite Nick to kick us off. Okay. okay. And I, I should say the combination, if we get that far, will be. Uh, Roxana speaking on the kind of the kind of places catapult. So in a sense, we should cover the whole world, and we have the whole world here because we have India from Indonesia. We have people from as far afield as Nottingham and Southampton, <laughs> not to mention UCL uh, and so on. Uh, obviously, trying to cover the situation as big as uh, India with 1.4 billion population is impossible. But what we've tried to do is to, um, in a series of events, home in on the issues that uh, uh, affect the future of the planet, because not just myself, but the OECD, no less, believe that the future of medium-sized cities is going to produce the most amount of economic growth and quite possibly consume the most amount of, eco of resources, natural resources. So in a sense, what happens to mid-sized cities, cities around half a million is vitally important, but really tends to be rather neglected. I would say putting it in a British context, I would talk about cities around 150, 200,000. That, that would give you a, a comparable situation. And, and we got into this, you might ask why, not just through having visited India and being struck by the pace of growth, but also the scope for making all the same mistakes as we've made in the UK, but also by winning the uh, Wilson Economic Prize in 2014 for showing how to build garden cities that were visionary, viable, and popular. And we tested the ideas out in Oxford, showing how it was possible to grow Oxford, double the size of Oxford, by just expanding along public transport corridors and avoiding building in uh, floodplains. The uh, first event, which was held with the Urban Design Group uh, back in 2017, uh, gosh, that's the report of the first symposium, um, led on to one uh, at the University of Westminster. And then we held two events in India. We One in Tirunavelli in Tamil Nadu, where Charles comes from, but also in, in Chennai, the capital uh, city. And so we um, 
were able to share these ideas and to draw on the views of, of particularly young Indians about what the future challenges were and, and various options. Um, and then we held uh, the last one, which was in 2021 in Bristol, where we tried to bring in the world. We had certainly the World Bank represented, uh, and we uh, had, I think, 14, a vast number of speakers um, using the magic of, of Zoom, but without the benefits of face-to-face -face, uh, conversation. Um, this time, I'm really pleased that we've managed to draw in the Connective Places catapult. And I would say that many of the ideas we talked about back in 2017 are actually being applied in terms of twinning, in terms of uh, looking at sustainable development and how it can be applied to the growth of, of cities. But we know that it's very easy to have great objectives, targets, zero carbon and so on, and then to build in an absolute opposite way. Uh, and in my view, what matters is not so much what countries dedicate themselves to do, or, but what happens in, in towns and cities, which means in, involving communities, because communities do have views and will stop things happening if they don't like them. And so uh, it seemed to me the critical issue was how you begin to work with people. So I was really excited when I went to uh, southern India on a sketching holiday, thanks to Maxine Relton, and I suddenly saw the, the future working uh, in the way that SCAD was working with the Veni villages. So I'm now going to draw on Maxine Relton to uh, say something about her impressions before introducing Charles. So Maxine, would you like to come up here? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. In a moment or two, I'm going to show you a very short uh, video of SCAD's work, which has been made uh, and encapsulating extremely well the broad base of the SCAD's achievements and work over uh, more than 30 years. Uh, but I'll just say very briefly before, before that, that's about seven minutes, but just a bit before that, I'll say something about how I came to know about SCAD. I was lucky enough to be invited as a visual artist to SCAD, my first visit to India. So in Tamil Nadu, uh, this was way back in 2008. And it was to document a couple of ecology projects associated with SCAD. And I don't know whether you've ever had one of those life affirming and life changing experiences in your life, but it, that was one of those moments for me that everything changed from then on. I was hugely impressed with the work that SCAD was doing in the communities and with local people. And I couldn't wait to go back there after just spending the, that first two or three weeks there. And so I asked SCAD if I could bring a group of people, charge them a little bit extra and that money we would give to SCAD for their work. And would they host a small group of people coming to draw there. And that's how the tours started. So ever since then, 2009, I've been taking sketching groups back to SCAD. I've expanded it since then, and we go traveling into um, quite a lot of other places. But we spend absolutely key beginning of the trip at SCAD to um, help people understand the extraordinary achievements of this organization in the 30 plus years that it's been founded. I hope you'll get some sense of that, uh, both from the little video that I'm going to show in a moment or two and from SCAD and um, from Charles himself, who will talk a little bit more after me. So just to say something very briefly before I introduce the video, to give you the example of how, how, it, how SCAD has chosen to work with people. Nick has mentioned in some of the introduction to this symposium about change and how we bring it about and how all of us um, encounter change and how we ex um, experience that ourselves, how resistant we are in all sorts of different ways. And how um, I just would like to give you an example of how it is that, that SCAD achieves extraordinary change. So one small example, if, um, some years ago, there was a couple from Leicester in the UK who always used to go to SCAD every January to find out what needed to be done in the way of um, local initiatives that were needed to be funded in some way. And uh, on uh, this particular trip, they were told about a village where the women 
had to leave the village every day to go and fetch water about two miles away. So, of course, they often had small children. They had to take the children with them. So it was a long way to get water and to bring it back and not to be able to carry huge amounts. Sometimes they might even have a child in their arms. Um, all of this was very difficult for the small village. So this couple heard about it and said, oh, here's something we can do. We can pay for a well to be um, made, to be bored right, out, right in the village. Um, and that will solve the problem. We have the money, we can do this. So SCAD approached the uh, elders in the village and offered this as a possibility, and they waited um, for the elders to meet and uh, to discuss the matter. And the answer came back, no, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> of course, the couple wanted to know why on earth uh, this was not acceptable and not welcomed. So Scad went back to the village and asked, uh, and the elders met again and dis uh, discussed it and whether to, to, to inform Scad about the situation. So the answer came back that the men in the village, who were the elders in the village, um, said that um, they really appreciated the quiet time when the women and the children went out of the village all morning to go and get the water. And uh, they didn't want to change that. <laughs> so. The next question was, well, it, can we still solve the problem for the women and the children, but also uh, not to disturb the whole arrangement as it stands? So what they did is they offered to build a well, to bore a hole and make a well just outside the perimeter of the village so that the women and children still left the village. Um, and there they uh, paid for and for helped to fund um, a health center and a school. So the solution there, as you can see, was one that in the end, having consulted and respected the local villagers and their views and so on, regardless of whether it was men or women or whatever, just the situation as an example of consulting people, finding out exactly what the issues are, and instead of just imposing something that seemed to be a clear solution, um, it was in fact a, a result of close cooperation and consultation that a solution was, was found that was even better in the end for everybody concerned. And that was, for me, such a wonderful example of the many, many, many things that I've learned from SCAD about the way they work with local people. Um, so I have endless stories like that that I want to tell you, but we're limited to 10 minutes each with so many speakers, so I can't tell you any more. So perhaps um, um, we can have the, uh, perhaps Robert, can you um, tell me what I need to do here to start this off? Um, thank you. And this is a short um, video of about seven minutes, and then I'll pass over to Charles, who's going to, uh, tell you a whole lot more in, in closer detail and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. This is the story of Skad Nirman, a remarkable organization in Tamil Nadu, southern India. Skad stands for social change and development and Nirman means development. The team started working in just five villages and today works with 600, helping more than 600,000 rural poor people. Taking a holistic approach, SCAD Nearman works in education, health and sanitation, women's development, care for the disabled and other special communities, plus agricultural and environmental activities. SCAD Nearman works with underprivileged and disadvantaged communities like Dalits and the most destitute communities who are involved in small and marginal farming, general coolie work, fishing, salt pan work, beady rolling and palmara climbing. Skad Nirman also works to support special groups like the gypsies, snake catchers, the leprosy affected and children and adults with disabilities. In 1985, Dr. Cletus Babu stepped out of his comfort zone of being a Catholic priest. With just 300 rupees in his pocket, he took a small but committed step to serve socially and economically deprived rural communities. His vision was to empower and emancipate the poorest of the poor in the villages. He was armed with his great passion for the neglected and marginalised and inspired by the motto, Reaching the Unreached. Skad Nirman empowers people to take back control of their own development. 
It takes a long-term, integrated approach to all areas of development work and supports local ownership and sustainability. So far, over half a million people have directly benefited from this community empowerment. Providing quality education is a key function of the SCAD Nirman, which has started various schools for rural children. These include pre-primary schools, a school for the gypsy children, and schools for differently abled children with physical and mental conditions such as cerebral palsy and autism. Graduate degree courses are offered in purpose-built polytechnic colleges, engineering colleges, colleges of education, teacher training institutes, industrial training institutes throughout Tamil Nadu. More than 13,000 students have seen the quality of their education improve in their village primary and middle schools. Research at SCAD's Farm Science Centre aims to increase production, productivity and income to farming communities, transferring technological innovations from the lab to the land. Environmentally friendly activities such as sustainable agriculture, horticulture, veterinary science, home science, fisheries and watershed programmes are being carried out. Wind energy is harnessed from SCAD Nirman's wind turbine. There is also a thriving soil fertility project, a bioenergy plant and biodigester. Microbial technology through a microbes brewing unit is another initiative promoted by SCAD Nearman. Women's development is very important. Today there are more than 3,500 women self-help groups in the villages adopted by SCAD Nearman, where Surabi, microfinance programs support the members. More than 100 women from SCAD Nirman groups have been elected as village presidents, ward members and councillors in local body elections after regular paralegal advice and trainings. In the field of health and hygiene, SCAD Nirman's medical centre seeks to address the medical needs of rural poor, who cannot access quality medical care and treatment at an affordable cost. A nutrition program has been established to reduce malnutrition among rural children up to three years old and ensure nutritional supplements for pregnant and breastfeeding mothers. SCAD also offers general medical camps, cataract surgeries, health education and training, immunisation, safe births and facilitates kitchen gardens, school gardens and herbal gardens. In line with a modern and effective holistic approach, SCAD Nirman's community-based rehabilitation vans provide exemplary healthcare services for disability care. They bring technical inputs and counselling, various forms of appropriate therapies and medication to disabled people in remote villages who are often very poor. This gives disabled people access to regular services and appropriate assistance so they can fully participate in life at home, at work and in their communities. SCAD Nirman's one-stop solution to the medical and therapeutic needs of rural children with special needs is the Rehabilitation Centre at Tilnavali. Fully equipped with physiotherapy, occupational therapy and hydrotherapy. An orthic and prosthetic unit and training centre makes and fits lightweight and efficient aids and appliances that are needed by disabled people. The list of ways that SCAD Nirman supports communities is long and varied. Here are some examples. SCAD Nirman founded a school exclusively for the children of the gypsy community and has built a total of 86 houses for gypsy families. For those needing leprosy special care, SCAD Nirman provides medical services as well as a monthly stipend for a decent and dignified life. SCAD Nirman has built a health centre and a community hall for their well-being. For elderly people with fa without families, SCAD Nirman provides care and attention, medical treatment, clothes, bed sheets, counselling and monthly stipends. Salt palm workers not only live in punery but also develop eyesight and skin problems and SCAD Nirman provides medical assistance to them. It also works to unite organised salt pan workers to ensure comprehensive protection. SCAD Nirman runs a pre-primary school for the children of salt pan workers. Fishermen and fisher coolies are supported by SCAD Nirman too, which provides education to the children of impoverished fishermen and raises their standard of living. Over the last 10 years, the inspirational and wide-ranging work of SCAD Nirman has been recognised with many awards, both within India and by the international community. There have been notable accolades from politicians, business groups, state assemblies and His Holiness the Dalai Lama, among others. 
The vision of Dr. Cletus Babu, his wife Amelie, and his team at SCAD has touched upon all segments of society. Mr. Cletus Babu says, We get the most pleasure when we can leave a village to stand on its own feet. More than a hundred villages have already made it to this stage. The main message in the work that I do is to love people and to go and share in their lives, to understand what they are going through. Caring for and mindful of all sectors of his society, right from the womb to the tomb, and the various awards and recognition are well deserved. May Skad Nirman march ahead with added strength and faith to reach its goal for the greater glory of God. So, um, as many like Maxine was explaining, uh, SCAD was started in the year 1985. So it's almost like uh, 38 years now. Um, I'm associated with SCAD from uh, 1987, so 35 years and the same organization. Uh, <clears throat> we have two entities in the organization. We have different uh, uh, education institutions, right from kindergarten to um, university level. Um, we have uh, different higher education centers like engineering, polytechnic, uh, college of education, teachers training, uh, special schools, higher secondary schools. So <clears throat> that's one part. We have 70 different uh, education institutions in SCAD. And uh, we have the other entity is like uh, uh, working in the community. So we started working uh, with five villages and we have, now we are working in 600 villages in three provinces. Um, so we are directly associated with uh, uh, somewhere around half a million people. And uh, there are 3,500 women self-help groups and 40,000 members in that organization. And we are doing, uh, so you know, probably you, you would have uh, known about uh, a very interesting uh, saying from Chinese, um, go to the people, love of them, live among them, start with what they know, uh, build on what they have, one of the best leaders, when their task is accomplished, when their work is done, people all say, we have done it ourselves. So that's the motto. Like, we want to, so we, we are not there to teach anything. There are a lot of things we can learn from the community. That's what we do. Like, we want to learn something from them and start from there. And um, because the need or whatever problem, it's there. So they have to decide what they want to do. So our, our uh, role is to help them, that's all. And uh, uh, when we started initially uh, in 1985, the, the important uh, problem, the major problem there is uh, uh, children dropped out from education. So probably like uh, if you enroll uh, like 100 children, uh, there will be 80 percentage dropped out from the school from, from class 1 to class 5. Before they complete class 5, there will be 80 percentage dropped out. So what we did, we start, we can't stop that. Because for various reasons, they are dropped out from schools. Uh, some of them, they don't like the school. Some of them, they don't like the teachers. There's no proper school, proper building. And uh, somebody, they want to look after their uh, uh, siblings. So all reasons. So what we try to do, like we started uh, supplementary education centers uh, only in the evening hours and uh, try to help them to rejoin the school. It took about three, four years. Then uh, slowly we enrolled a few ch children into the school. So when you're enrolling into the school, there are other issues in the family we have to look after. So there'll be like health issues or economic uh, problems. So address all these issues. So that's how... Uh, what we see that we want to uh, do an integrated approach in the village. So there'll be like a health uh, uh, program, there'll be uh, economic development program, there'll be community outreach program, community development program, water related issues, everything will be there. So 
so over the years, we have done a lot of work. And uh, so Dr. Cletus, he is the founder, and uh, we started in the year 1985. Uh, so these are the thrust areas like uh, uh, community education, holistic health care, then the ecology and environment, uh, community organization, and inclusion of neglected communities. So, uh, because we couldn't see the film with that, that was the idea, like uh, we would have seen the, most of the activities there. So, then what has happened, like uh, uh, with the support of um, um, Urban Trust, uh, we want to go for some housing projects initially. Then uh, at the moment, what you are thinking, we are going to establish a center for sustainable development in the campus. So the, that's uh, called the uh, Gardens of Delight. Uh, so we want to promote uh, sustainable food initiatives, like uh, there should be a proper food um, supply to the community, then uh, uh, for su uh, sustainable living spaces, then uh, water management, there should be some proper water for the community. Then uh, sustainable renewable energy sources for the community. And uh, uh, we should address the climate uh, change and mitigation and other things. And uh, also, we want to promote uh, indigenous medicine systems. So this is the place that we are aiming at uh, to promote that whole activities. So already we are doing different uh, sustainable activities. And uh, we are want to pull everything into one space so that people can come and learn. We can also go and share with them. So... So the initial one, what we were, what we are trying um, to provide housing, it should be a sustainable housing, uh, affordable housing, and we have built one house, a model house in the campus. Uh, this is like a hundred percent solar powered. There's no ex external uh, electricity there. It's hundred percent solar powered. All the um, uh, equipments or everything in the house is powered by solar. There's a two kilowatt solar system. And uh, you can see at the bottom, there's a like a like egg shaped stuff. There's a 20,000 liters uh, rainwater housing system. There's a filter, which can filter the rainwater, it can be stored. So for example, if we need uh, for a house, if you need about uh, 100 liters of like proper pure water for drinking, cooking and stuff, this can go for 200 days. You fill up water, at least for 150 days, there's an ensured water supply. Even if you have proper rain for two days in a year, there'll be enough water for the family for drinking and cooking. And, and there's a proper filter system there. And, and uh, you know, the uh, probably you would have heard about uh, Laurie Baker, uh, the one of the famous uh, architecture from uh, UK, went to India, and he started working there, stayed there for all his life. And he has built beautiful houses and buildings and hotels and uh, offices, everything in India. And uh, we took some model from him. And uh, this particular model is called a rain trap, uh, rat trap model. Uh, there's a passive cooling in the house. And, uh, and the, the floor, we are made with handmade tiles. Then uh, the roof, uh, with the embedded tiles and uh, so we, are, we, we we try to include all possible sustainable models. This is not the ideal model. You don't say this is the best one, but we are trying to do that. And uh, there's a recycle uh, waste recycling system, uh, grey water uh, recycle everything in that house. <coughs> Sorry. Then the second important thing what we are trying to do to promote uh, uh, food security. And uh, every year we plant around 2000 uh, uh, kitchen garden, herbal garden, and uh, tree planting. So the idea is like, um, so during monsoon season, we provide a small kit with vegetable seeds and herbal seeds and herbal plants. And <clears throat> they can grow them during the monsoon season, just for the monsoon season. From October, November, December, January, February, March. At least during this five months, they can get vegetables. 
we are not going for summer if there's no enough water we can't expect people to grow so what we are trying to do wherever possible we grow our own vegetables <coughs> sorry and uh, we are also promoting biochar you know it's a growing uh, interest about biochar it's nothing but proper a uh, good quality carbon uh, which is uh, uh, from the trees or waste materials waste wood or something we can extract carbon which can uh, give you we can uh, seek uh, carbon sequestrate like put them into the soil and also this is a good way of uh, uh, as a soil amendment so we have a carbon biochar unit then <clears throat> this is one of the biggest um, bio digester in south india this can recycle 1 ton organic wet waste and produce <clears throat> about uh, so oh, 100 cubic meters of methane which can produce about uh, uh 100 kilowatt energy electricity meanwhile which can also produce 200 liters of organic uh, uh liquid fertilizer and every 2 to 3 months this can produce Two to three tons or organic dry um, compost. So this is used with the uh, along with the farmers. They can collect them and use it in the farm. And the electricity which is produced from this uh, unit is used for lighting all the street light in the campus. And the excess gas is used for cooking. <laughs> we have a bio uh, microbiology unit we are producing a uh, um bio uh, beneficial microbes uh, effective microbes or beneficial microbes uh, probably some of us uh, we know that about uh, the beneficial microbes will help the the whole environment you can use it for human use or animal use composting we have a unit and we are testing in the farm and supplying to the farmers and this is another interesting thing uh, we are trying to renovate all the existing traditional water structures in the villages so if you are, uh, if you have been to tamil nadu the southern like states of india tamil nadu karnataka and andhra pradesh especially not kerala and all these three states they are like rajasthan part of them is a dry state dry region and in olden days they had traditional water structures to collect rain water during a monsoon season store them and that's the only source of drinking water for the community but what has happened after independence most of the water structures are neglected because people started building huge dams and uh, uh, water system supply water pipeline supply everything and they lost these things so now we realize it's important and we are restoring all the traditional water structures there are two things one for irrigation second one for drinking water so far we have renovated more than 200 uh, water structures like this <clears throat> and we create a small uh, water committee and they are responsible for the continuous uh, maintenance of the tanks and uh, uh, we have uh, solar uh, um systems like uh, 150 kilowatt solar and 250 kilowatt uh, wind power so the idea is the because it's a big campus and we have different institution we should we want to produce our own energy so the most of the energy which produced is given to the national grid and from there we take so whatever excess we should pay if there is an excess production the government will pay us or we will pay a small amount of money for there Uh, government system so every year as maxine was mentioning we we produce about uh, 100 between 100 and 150000 seedlings and supply to the farmers women groups schools community lands so far we have planted more than uh, around 3 million trees
so these are some of the uh, sustainable initiatives which we have done over the years so i had the idea of send this center the center for uh, sustainable development to, to promote these ideas to uh, the wider public and uh, now uh, we are inviting like uh, uh, like children from different schools other ngos government officials then uh, uh, volunteers even general visitors they can come and learn and uh, we also go to the village and schools and other places to teach them about these activities and we are promoting this so so what, this is another interesting thing what we are trying to do like wherever possible we want to grow vegetables as i mentioned earlier this one house we have a beautiful uh, uh, like a planter on top of the roof and uh, uh, this can easily produce about uh, uh, 100 to 150 kilos of vegetables during that monsoon season just for four to five months easily so we invite students from uh, other organization and uh, institutions so so this is another important thing probably uh, you would have heard about this is called uh, appropriate paper based technology and it's a uh, in the uk in many parts of europe america and other parts they are doing this so from waste material we can make a lot of aids and appliances for people with the disabilities especially for children with the disabilities so these these are made by waste paper so all the uh, equipment is made by waste paper <coughs> for example if you are producing a uh, for a sitting chair for a disabled person every 6 months to 1 year you have to change Uh, it's not possible in india because it's very expensive so what we are trying to do use these material bring out uh, models to shoot the person so every 6 month we can uh, dismantle and do another one doesn't cost more than 500 rupees 5 5 pounds so also we conduct exhibitions of all these important uh, sustainability initiatives in institutions villages where people can learn so uh this is some of the initiative what we are doing and uh, some of them probably you can see in the in the film when you have time and uh, i thank uh, nicolas and the team for giving this opportunity thank you so this one about the house we got the Uh, green platinum award from the green building council of india we got a chance for some questions for charles um so please um take this opportunity immediate pressing questions yes oh i if, i know if i do this you, we've got microphones that will pick up your voice as well there we go <coughs> we should be able to this this microphone's hanging yeah what is asked um in relation to the gentleman spoke about the vegetation growing in a building of the um, with food these things and a lot of research I've been doing was looking at the other side which is the impacts of um mining and urban environments mining mining urban environments so My question is: Is that we want renewable technology, right? We want solar panels, wind turbines, cars. I don't know about the regions you talked about. Uh, this urban uh, growing and the example, but for example, if you look at in Jharkhand, which is a major mining state in India, <coughs> and also even in Africa, there's been a lot of connections, <coughs> not random connections. real proper connection strong between the impacts of mining minerals for its own products which is essential for PV panels on the urban environment and the farmland so we want these renewable technologies at the same time the evidence which is coming from these technologies is filtering into the water base is filtering into the farmlands and I just want to get your thoughts because um You can't do any of that stuff in the UK. You can't do any of the mining in Europe. You have to rely on, on the line of 
lining in China. Where's the wrong where we want these technologies? Also at the same time, is there any really cognizance of how to have these technologies? We have to have to see complete reversal of the urban environment going towards stabilization instead of re urbanization. I don't have an answer. <laughs> Nobody got an answer, I don't think so. So the <clears throat> issue is like when there's a new green technology coming up, people started going there, ultimately. So like about 10, 15 years back, people started hybrid cars. Now we are going for electric cars. Everybody know that in another 10 years time, there'll be a huge pile of batteries going to be some lying somewhere else. That's true. I don't know. But what we are trying to do, at least with the community, wherever path, see, India is a fast growing country. And uh, we are sure that it's going to be a huge impact of any development happening around the world in India, because now India is the main target for many of the companies. And uh, so, so, because so far, so most of the market in Europe is finished. Most of the market is China is finished. So the two possibilities, one in India, there's a huge population, 1.4 billion people, and there's a huge market. And second one is Africa. Uh, we don't know <laughs> what will be the impact in another 10 years. The, the questions you are asking. Can I just say, it's not about what's going to be an impact in 2030. Because I've met some finances in the last few years. They're saying, the, the guy asked me, he says, I understand they want to electrify the whole village. I guess they do. He says, you know how much greenery you need to remove across the whole village? He says, you need to remove me, you remove, you need to remove every single blade of grass in the forest to get the cobalt and the titanium and all these resources out of the ground. So this is something happening now with the modern forest western gas or any other yeah. thing. Yeah. So my question is, is uh, when I see this reorganization where I use tricks, that's not a plus because we're actually only replenishing what we've lost by doing this mass mining. And that's just the demand for million. Then we look at what's happening, what we want in the UK, what we want in Germany. And I'm just like, where does it, where does it stop? Is, is <coughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure this is, I'm not sure that it's a good question, but I'm not sure it's one that, Charles can necessarily answer from a perspective of scale, unless you want to come back on that. I, th I think let, let's pause it for a moment. We've got time for one more question before we go on to our next speaker. Yeah, over here. <coughs> Charles, it's really impressive seeing the <coughs> things that visually jump at you, the energy, all the things you're deploying. Um, and I think they're all things that we understand. I think the things we don't understand in the question for you is the magic and the strategies that are invisible that go behind this, how to mobilize the communities, how to mobilize the economics, your business model that could be redeployed. Um, and I'm sure that's a much, much bigger conversation, but equally interesting in this way, your strategies and your business model. If you had to like write a kind of way in which this could be reproducible, the um, techniques, all the visible things are extraordinary to the energy and whatever else. But, yeah. The idea. Which be your advice for somebody else reproducing your your vision somewhere else? Yeah. How to go about it? See, uh, I would say so far that we are, so this particular model is taken in many parts of India, okay. and uh, uh, I would say like uh, at least uh, twenty thirty organization from Africa they are visiting us. We don't say that this is the best model, but we are trying something for the community, which is taken by other uh, countries. And we are also going to other countries like uh, uh, I'm going, I'm visiting uh, most of the African countries like Rwanda, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania. And we are, we are trying to help them, some of the initiatives in other countries. It's always, it's always the yeah, difficult thing. That we, you, you hear Charles talk about, we have women's groups, and they, oh, we have 3,500. You think, 
my goodness, you know, <laughs> some, something incredible is happening here. Nick, Nick let, let, we need to move on. So There's make... a philosophy that Herbert uh, has tried to apply of looking and learning. Instead of just relying on books and lectures and so on, there is something to be said for actually going to see how things work, being impressed by transformation, and then being inspired to replicate it elsewhere, just like Charles uh, has gone to McConfley's <laughs> cat and then said, well, if they've done this at a slate quarry, why can't we do something similar uh, next to our biodigester? So I, I do feel that part of the secret in going forward is being able to identify replicable models, write them up, have pictures of them, and visit them as we, well, Maxine has been taking groups. It, it, it seems so obvious, and yet we don't do it. We look for some wonderful algorithm, rather, rather than realizing that people on the whole learn from experience from what they see. Obviously, they can see false models. They can go to Manhattan and say, as China did, oh, why can't we re replicate Manhattan in the Chinese cities? And, and that's the danger. And I'd like to think there is also a case we're looking at grassroots projects like uh, Scout. Yeah. I'm, 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 my, my responsibility to chair is that keep us on time, and I'm already failing on that. So, can I just keep? Can I can I keep the question for a moment, or go on quickly yes. out the question? Yes. And yeah. yeah. I, mean, I found it very interesting and impressive. But uh, my question is about what is the kind of um, challenge mm -hmm. between um, sort of really poverty of the. the hand-built huts and stuff, I mean, really absolutely basic. And then your brick-built uh, ecological housing western side. So, uh, you know, how does that match up? Where do they get the bricks from? Where do they get the, the, the wind mills from, from produced in, in, in Scotland or what else? Uh, the, the, the solar panels, very expensive, very, very uh, resource-consuming to, to, to make. I mean, they're, they're not ecological, so you don't really know, even if you take the sun for, for so, so Charles the question so, is the gap between the, the the house that's been created and the needs of the poorest people particularly this house all the materials sourced local so you have to clay there I mean, you make the bricks yeah, yeah. yeah. it's local local bricks except the solar panel it's all locally sourced but the solar panel no except the solar panel yeah. solar panel no of course from the company See, in India, 60% of the electricity is produced by atomic power. So at least we are doing a small contribution for the green energy. We are not sure that that's the best thing. There may be another, another efficient model that will come later. We are going to talk. At the moment, what we are trying to do at least in our campus, let's use green energy. So it's not like UK, because in here, uh, you can buy green energy for your house for a, for a particular company, which is supplying only clean energy. But in India, we don't have that. There's no uh, specific company supplying green energy, the green uh, company. So it's all like, uh, one pool from the national grid. But for us, what we think, we should produce some green energy for ourselves. That's why we are trying to build wind and solar system. Okay, can I ask you to introduce our next speaker and then we'll have a break afterwards. So, Somnia um, Pathasari, I always say that, you'll say name wrong, I'm so sorry. Um, is from Arabs, Director of Urban Designer Arabs, and he's going to talk in particular I think, about their Arabs. Arid, arid Cities project. Yes, thank okay. you. Um, let me just open this. So Nick invited me to speak a little bit about our research on building in arid environments. So I'm going to move from the very sort of grassroots local presentation by Charles and step up a little bit to a slightly more sort of global overview of um, rethinking cities in arid environments. Now, uh, Arab is a, for those of you who don't know, it's a multidisciplinary global firm. We are engineers, urban designers, planners, 
Uh, we offer advisory services, specialist technical services to clients all over the world. Um, but we also do our own research into many topics of interest to us that we then apply in our work. So this was actually a piece of research funded by ourselves and it uh, uh, originated in our um, Dubai office because we do have offices in the Middle East. Uh, we work in Southern Africa, we work in South America and many places which could be which, which could be described as arid. So this was our, um, our, our research based on some of the work we're doing, but also research into work other people are doing into what we can do better in arid environments. Uh, and I think why Nick thought this would be useful for this group is because um, Arid environments, although you tend to think of it as, as deserts, are also places where there's water scarcity. That's one of the big sort of descriptors of arid environments. And you could apply it to parts of India, including Tirunelveli, where, where SCAD is based. So what are arid environments? You can see a map globally. 30% of the world's area is can be classified as arid. Arid, there's hyper-arid, there's arid, and there's semi-arid. And that's only going to grow with, with climate change. Um, and typically they are not areas, you know, surprisingly, some arid environments are humid as well. So it's not that they can't be humid, but they are characterized by a peculiar combination of temperature and lack of water uh, that uh, basically make things uh, quite difficult to, to, to grow and, and has uh, issues of resilience in terms of drinking water and uh, irrigation water and so on. So I then took that, I mean, if you if you go back, you can see most of the arid environments okay, where they are, and you can see a little bit of it in, in India, which is the little triangle in the middle. And of course, we all know Rajasthan is arid, but I was quite surprised to see the little swathe of aridity in the middle of India. So I looked a little bit closer and you can see uh, the first, the climate zones, and you can't read it in, in great detail, but the red bits are classified as uh, arid hot steppes. So you can see, of course, you know the desert in Rajasthan is that way, but then you also see a little piece of the Deccan coming right down to uh, Tamil Nadu, which is which is classified in that way. And then the middle one is temperature, and you can see the highest temperature, the darkest color, is also uh, where in, in southern India and Tirunelveli is like pretty much in the in the bottom of the bottom of the country. So uh, clearly, I mean, there are um, lessons to be learned from this piece of research that we can apply. And if you look at Tirunal Valley itself, hot semi-arid climate, moderate to low precipitation, hot and humid uh, in, in terms of experience of the temperature, uh, and also susceptible to flooding. And because it's a primarily agricultural area, and, and Charles can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the fluctuation in monsoon rains and, and, and river flooding can have a disproportionate impact. And you talked about the um, the traditional ways of storing water. And if you lose that, I mean, you're essentially left with flash floods, you're left with no monsoon, and you're left with no water because the groundwater and aquifers aren't getting recharged. So um, huge, huge issues in this kind of uh, uh, environment. So I just put this here because um, there's a metric that we use that's not just temperature, humidity, wind, but it's a combination of all of that, which defines comfort levels. And you can see what Tirunal Valley is. 12 months of the year, most of the day, for 50 to 100%, it is oppressive. That is a technical term. Um, and I just cheekily decided to put a, a, a London comparator over there. And I did it for two reasons. One is because, you know, those of us who live in London should stop complaining about the weather. Uh, but, but secondly, because ju just to make the point that look at the difference in temperature between two places which otherwise see very similar methods of construction and everything else, at least contemporary uh, methods of construction. And this is just to argue that we really absolutely need to have a different way of building, of dealing with water, of dealing with air, of dealing with our microclimates, of dealing with outdoor and indoor comfort levels in, in these two places, certainly. And some of that insight can come from uh, a vernacular, uh, but, but we can also use modern technology to sort of reinforce that. Okay, so then coming back to the cities alive, uh, rethinking cities in arid environment. This is, uh, I've got a couple of copies which I'll, I'll send around, but you can download it from our website. You don't need to uh, copy what's, what's up there. You can just Google it. You can say rethinking cities in arid environments, Arab, and it'll, it'll show up and it's free to download. 
what are the key challenges of arid environments? There are many, which the report will say, but the three top ones are urban heat island, which is defined as the concept that urban areas, whether they're medium cities, large cities, small cities, will tend to be several degrees hotter than their hinterlands because of the materials that you use to build, not just your, your buildings, but also your roads, your public realm, they tend to absorb heat and radiate heat. And, and this is a huge issue. And with climate change, that's only going to exacerbate. Uh, well, I grew up in Delhi. Uh, in summers, it would hit 45 degrees. That was hot. Uh, last year, it was 49 and a half degrees. And this, you know, in, in, in the space of a few decades, it's five degrees higher, it regularly hits. And part of this is climate change, but part of this is the urban heat island effect that we're seeing as well. Water scarcity is the other huge challenge. Again, because historically, many of these cities had traditional ways of, of managing and maintaining their water. They don't anymore. We rely on, on centralized water supplies. Uh, we don't uh, treat our waste properly. And, 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 and that's really leading to, to issues. And the last thing I put was governance, because if you actually see how you can address the issues we have in arid environments, whether it's building e ecologically friendly housing or, or, or waste to energy or, or water, whatever it is, it, not one person can do it. There's lots of little bits that need to be joined up. And I think that's one of the big issues. In order to build in these kinds of environments, you need a pretty holistic, integrated way of, uh, of, of planning our cities. And that's where we often fall, not just in places like India or other places, even in, 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 in London, which has a, a functioning planning system. It's very difficult to jo join the dots. So the, what the report says, the key principles to shape the next century of, of city buildings, one is we have to learn from the past, invest in green and blue, which is essentially plants and water in our cities, which we are losing rapidly, and design intelligent building and public spaces. And what that means is we do have modern technology. We have uh, 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 you know, technological ways to assess what's, what, what works and what doesn't work. So let's not just learn from the past. Let us learn from the past, but let's also apply what we know now. Um, what can we do? The, the report talks about three scales of intervention, uh, cities, public spaces, and buildings. And there are different things you can do at these different scales um, in an integrated way that would help us make sure we, uh, we design better cities and living environments in these kinds of hot places. Um, I won't go through it in detail, but there's a whole bunch of things you can do at city scale, uh, preventing urban sprawl, which, which Nick started the, the talk with. Uh, appropriate densities, decentralized infrastructure, SUDs, we all know, water, water recycling, better policy and codes. These are the things which individual projects or landowners can't do by themselves, have to be done at city level. What you see on the right is, uh, uh, is Antofagasta in Chile, which is uh, one of the so driest cities in the world. It's about 400,000 people in, in Chile. It's a mining town. And uh, uh, they had two problems which they identified. One is they had absolutely no green space, very, very, very poorly saved, served by green space, and they had no water. And so they, at a city level, initiated a water recycling program where they treated all their wastewater with two goals. One is they would try to recharge their groundwater, try to save every drop of water, but then use it to irrigate their public spaces. And they intended to grow their public space provision threefold from something like uh, 60 hectares to three times that in, in a period of 10 years. And so uh, these are things which only cities can do. And, and so there's a, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do at city level. Um, I I'll, I'll, won't go through this in, in, in great detail now. And then public spaces. And again, how do you design for walking in areas that are really hot? Uh, how do you future-proof mobility? I mean, you know, a lot of these cities, they... Um, they are, are, are using more cars, but you know, how, do you, how do you change that uh, over time uh, into either electric mobility or micro mobility or walking and cycling and so on, or, or public transport? How do you uh, use zeriscape, which is another word for native landscapes that don't need much water? How do you deal with irrigation, microclimate design? So the picture that, that you see there is Wadi Hanifa in, in Riyadh, which is a really nice example because in the Middle East, you have a lot of these wadis that are carved right through the landscapes, and they're carved because 
that's where the flash flooding occurs. So they are wet for like a few days of the year when, when it's flooded and the rest of the time it's pretty dry. And Wadi Hanifa was one of those places. But what they've done uh, over time for 100 kilometers is, is really start building some check dams, keep some water, use some minimal pumping, for example, to have a bit of water in that, in that wadi year round, which has made it a really nice destination, which has helped preserve some of the water rather than lose everything in a flash flood uh, and, and thereby recharge some aquifers. So there are some small local techniques you can use to have some, some massive impact. And this one is, uh, is what technology can do. So on the right side, you have these three squares, which are basically uh, some assessments that we did on a project that we did in, in, in Oman, a thermal analysis, a wind speed analysis, uh, and an existing condition analysis to try and say, okay, what is, what is the data telling us? Where is it hot? And what it led to is it allowed us to orient the building in the right possible way to manage to capture all the prevailing wind. Uh, we also learned that east-west streets are the most exposed to sun, and so they need to be really narrow, and the building form needs to shade those streets. And the north-south streets, which are not quite so sun exposed, can be wider, they can have trees, and that's where you put your pedestrian and, and cycle walks. And you know, so you, you can help. I mean, the, the, I'm sure this uh, knowledge existed uh, traditionally, but you know, for, for us working slightly more globally, I think technology can help us arrive at the same solutions. And the other diagram that you see is, is quite an interesting one. It's if you build a bigger building that you're cooling, typically what you do is you put your cool air exhaust in the roof. What if you put it at the pedestrian level? So you're actually beginning to create some microclimates and helping and, and using your, your energy to, to best advantage. Um, and then finally, of course, buildings, I won't go through it in much detail. Obviously, SCADs experimented with uh, one eco home. There are many, many uh, materials and techniques you can use, which are bespoke to different areas that that work best. Uh, I, I love that little example there. That was in Noida, Delhi. There's a factory that was spewing out uh, hot air from that the, the the grate that you can see at the back, and and uh, and the courtyard in front of it was absolutely uninhabitable. And so a local architect just did an art installation, used terracotta tubes, put some water in it, and just placed it in front of it. So the hot air that was being spewed out just went through the terracotta, and it was several degrees cooler when it came on the other side. So just you know something artistic, but but something terribly functional as well. And so the report then ends with a model arid city. Of course, as I said, this was developed by our Middle East office, so it has a distinctly Middle Eastern look to it. Um, but what, that's not important. What is important is it identifies um, about 36, and there could be more different um, recommendations under those three areas of intervention that you can do. And uh, if you actually look at it in detail, there's not a, it's not a single solution for every arid area, but each of those things can be done differently. Uh, and, and, and that's what the report really tries to say. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. For those of you who've not found them, uh, Maxine has pointed out she's left some of her sketchbooks on the table at the back there uh, for perusal. So please, when you get a chance afterwards, have a look at the sketchbooks. Um, I realized that when I was chair of the Academy of Urbanism, my... Oh, and there's some brochures about SCAD on the table over here. Um, the main thing you need as a chair is a big voice to pull people back together again. Otherwise, they just keep networking. It's terrible. Um, I have just mentioned that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we know, we've now got Brian Love um, uh, from, the Connect, from Connected Cities, Chief Executive, I see, from the CV of Connected Cities. Um, who's been doing work in both the UK and in India. So I'm going to hand over to Brian. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you're well aware, um, potentially we have a dramatic change in the climate coming. Uh, and Chennai in particular, uh, not long ago, experienced uh, the hottest day it's ever had and it ran out of water. Um, and a large producer, in fact, the biggest producer by sector, um, of carbon emissions is the transport sector and all the other sectors are slowly going down but unfortunately the transport sector is still increasing however not everything is equal in the transport sector and as you will see from this diagram certain vehicles produce more carbon emissions than others uh, and by far the lowest is rail 
Rail is also very good at moving people around in quite large numbers. Uh, again, this produced this diagram by um, the American Association of Local Government, and undoubtedly um, railways and on-street trams are the most effective way of producing large numbers of people to move. So what we're interested in is how can you make best use of the existing structures that we have, and particularly rail structures. Um, a very good example of doing this is the London Overground. Uh, it was all there before, but what happened was it was used very inefficiently and wasn't connected together. The Transport for London decided to take on board all the various franchises that ran bits of the network, put them together into one integrated package, which did involve doing quite a bit of work to adjust platform heights and signaling systems and so forth. Um, but for the relatively low cost of only £200 million, pounds, um, they produced an entirely new network for London, uh, which has had enormous success. And its cost per kilometre was remarkably low. A similar kind of process is currently underway in Turana Valley, um, in southern Tamil Nadu, uh, where the existing single track system is being doubled because there is a continuing uh, or an increasing demand for rail transport uh, in India. But rail transport in India is rather different from rail transport in Europe and the UK. It's almost entirely long distance, but that actually has some opportunities. Um, this is an example of a proposed metro system using the existing heavy rail tracks uh, around Chandigarh. Uh, Chandigarh was intending to have its own new metro system, and they've had about four stabs at creating one. But metro systems don't come cheap when you build them from scratch. Uh, and so it's never actually happened. This proposal, uh, which is now being seriously considered, uh, involves using the existing tracks in a different way to produce a regular metro service. Now, we've always focused on an idea that was developed not by us, but by someone called Ebenezer Howard. Uh, which is that of the garden city and groups of garden cities linked together to create what Howard called the social city. Um, that was a great idea of Howard's. The only problem was there aren't any kind of big gaps in the countryside at present where you could build a group of new cities. Um, so what we've done is we've taken his underlying principles and applied them to the existing rail networks uh, and the existing townships. And what emerged from this was my colleague um, decided that connected city would be a good way of achieving the same thing as a social city, but using the existing infrastructure. And so a connected city has a hub town, which is the largest of the group of towns that federate together. And they're all within 15 minutes travel time of one another. And all of their growth would be focused around their railway stations, whether they're existing railway stations or whether they're new ones. Um, but the maximum travel time from a hub to even the most far-flung part of the connected city would be 15 minutes. Within each of these nodes around the railway stations, there will be a 15-minute neighbourhood. So in other words, development will be encouraged within walking distance of uh, the railways and the railway service would be upgraded to what is currently being called metroization, a metro scale service. Um, now, Howard originally worked out a very similar scheme for his garden cities, and they accommodate a population of around about 30,000 people, but at garden city densities. So in other words, you have a population of 30,000, but the density of that, it gives you about 100 persons per hectare. And that's what figure that the UN uses to define the minimum density that can actually deliver good, sustainable public transport. It gives you around about 10,000 dwellings. Um, but within that area, 50% of your land is open space. If you experiment with this system on Turin Valley, 
uh, you find that what you have is a series of existing stations, um, and these are the ones that fall within 15 minutes travel time of Tirunavelli with the existing services. Because the great thing about Tirunavelli, it's where four railway systems come together. It's called Tirunavelli Junction. Um, but the numbers of trains are relatively low. Uh, as you can see here, um, they're, even on the maximum, there are only eight trains a day, which leaves you substantial gaps. The, if all of Tirunavelli's development was focused in these one kilometre, 15 minute neighbourhoods around the existing stations, um, it could accommodate another 160,000 people um, very straightforwardly, even at the kind of densities that are considered low by Indian standards, because Indian urban densities can be very much higher than what we're used to having in Europe. Um, this is an example of uh, an existing town, uh, town of Petai, which is on the western, yes, you can see it's the second western existing station. Um, and this is applying our diagram of how um, green space, developed space, urban space, and in the centre, mixed use space at a higher density, um, would apply to a town that's currently there. The yellow lines represent protected walkways. They are routes which are segregated from vehicular traffic, uh, and intended to encourage active travel movement. Um, in the West, they would tend to be protected by overhead canopies, which had transparent um, photovoltaic glass to fund them. Um, however, of course, in India, where you have an abundance of sunshine and what you're really looking for is shade, uh, they could be solid um, PV. Now, we do accept the fact that there's a carbon footprint associated with creating PV, but it's much offset by the fact that you're producing electricity from sunlight. Um, the core of the town is mixed use. The greener areas outside tend to be, well, what happens in, as we all know, in <coughs> southern India is you have a monsoon. Um, and as was shown by Charles, uh, it's possible to retain some of that water if you plan for it. And so what we were proposing would be it would be associate appropriate to have blue-green infrastructure that worked its way right into the core of the town. There's potential for new 15-minute neighbourhoods around new stations. And depending on the kind of densities at which we chose to develop, you can accommodate up to 500,000 people. Now, at present, Tirunavelli City uh, is in, proposed to expand into the agricultural areas around it that currently feed it. The advantage of focusing on public transport is that you will reduce the take of um, agricultural land uh, and you would reduce the carbon footprint of all these new people because you'd be providing them with the kind of public transport that encourages people not to have cars or two-wheelers or three-wheelers, which are very common in India, um, in the first place. In order to actually deliver this, we've been looking at ways of engaging community and all the various stakeholders to work out an efficient system whereby they could develop cities. And the two particular tools that we're interested in are, have been developed by two companies, one Space Syntax and the other Geo Design Hub. Space Syntax have a long history of modeling land use and transport connectivity. Uh, in particular, they have a very, very efficient system for modeling walkability. This diagram on the screen at present, the, uh, the red areas indicate areas of high walkability. Um, the green areas moderate and the blue areas low walkability. And so you can see quite clearly that <clears throat> if you have an outlying suburb 
the, the chances are that it will not have high walkability ability. So space syntax do analysis. GeoDesign Hub, on the other hand, what they facilitate is negotiations between groups of people to discuss scenarios. They use their techniques to get groups of people who apparently have very conflicting requirements to come together and discuss and understand what each other's criteria are and what options there are for finding common ground. And the most, ex I mean, they've been doing this all over the planet for quite a long time. Um, but probably the most extreme example they have uh, is in South America, where you have mining companies who essentially want to just rip chunks of the landscape out in large quantities and sell them onto other people. And you have indigenous people who are living there and having their landscapes destroyed. Uh, and you have groups of people who are campaigning to stop this whole process happening. What using GeoDesign Hub techniques, they were able to get to a point where no one group won, as it were, in the sense that they got 100% of what they wanted, but each group got around about 80% of what they wanted because they forced the mining companies to realize that they were not going to be allowed to just go on doing what they've been doing for the last 50 years. Something had to change. But on the other hand, the campaigners were eventually convinced that they weren't going to stop mining dead in its tracks and never have any more. What they discovered was that by closing down several of the existing mines, not opening up any new ones in one area, but opening up one new one in another area, a compromise could be reached in which, as I say, 80% of what everybody wanted could be achieved in consensus. So I use that as an example of what a geodesign hub can do. Our proposal is to run stakeholder workshops, uh, and these are about comparing scenarios. So you begin by using space syntax's skills to model the uh, possible scenarios and their carbon footprints. You then use GeoDesign Hub to work out where there are areas of common ground. On the basis of that, space syntax go away and rework their model in the site of what's been developed. Um, they then bring this back, and once again, GeoDesign Hub used their techniques and their IT-based techniques, a very strong visualization, um, in order to see where this leads. And then finally, you end up with a third scenario. Um, and then eventually you get to the point where you take all this and you put it back together. Now, this is all done in the space of, it can be done in an afternoon, although it's rather hectic. Uh, it's normally done in the space of one day. But it, what it does enable people to do is to leap forward from where they began to having a vision as to where they might well go. And the kind of participants that we're talking about here are all the people on the list in front of you. Um, but they all need to understand each other's problems. They all need to understand each other's motives. And they all need to understand what can and cannot be achieved. And what these combination of these two tools together, we believe, will genuinely enable the ability to area-wide strategic approach to be developed so that the lowest carbon footprint that's compatible with all the things that everybody wanted can be identified. So thank you very much. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. If you'd like to know more about this, this is our website. Um, should you uh, want to find it by Googling, please put in connected cities as all one word, uh, because then we turn up absolutely at the top of the list. If you put it in as two words, we turn up on page 136 or something, you know, so <laughs> it's a non-starter. <laughs> anyway, thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions to the end? I'm oh, yeah, trying to I'll, save. Yeah. Um, some time at the end for questions, but if I if I open it up now, I'm just going to lose control of the timetable altogether. So um, I should know this, but is David Milner here? You are. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Um, I, let's um, so create um, create streets. Is David Milner? 
Um, he, uh, I haven't been entirely briefed about what you're going to say, but I know there's some work in India, so please go ahead. Yeah. This works. Are we being recorded? So that's you can hear me. That's all good, isn't it? Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so in terms of briefing on what I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about anything Indian. So, just as a sort of caveat, I don't have any expertise there and have not worked there. So, um, you can sort of ignore this if you want to. But I think hopefully we can try and learn some lessons from our research. Um, and what I think I'm on what Nick's asked me to talk about, um, I would have happily gone into a lot on transport and connectivity. But I think we've got a lot of good speakers and Brian's obviously just touched on that. So I'm going to focus on um, what we talk about a lot, which is how how to deliver the density in a popular way, um, which is why we're looking at creating streets. Uh, so um, a little bit about, uh, so we, we do lots of research and publications, essentially sort of building the evidence base to then uh, look at, okay, how can we use this evidence base on the ground? We started doing that more and more now using this evidence, combining with community engagement to deliver places working with local authorities, developers, um, whoever, whoever wants to kind of talk to us. Um, I guess looking at some of the initial research that we did was pushing back at guidance and looking at why is it that we're, we're not able to reproduce some of the very high density, incredibly popular places that you know a lot of people know and love. Um, you know, examples from, from London here, you know, about where you can't reproduce this now due to different bits of guidance, you know, whether it's light, whether it's back to back distance, which is something that lots of urbanists have kind of heard and talks about where you've got your, you know, your 20 meters back to back distance, which is really quite arbitrary. And that's preventing you from, you know, really developing quite high density mid rise um, housing. Um, I put in a few bits and pieces here around sustainability. I know that's quite a big focus to say, how can you, um, in, in such a, you know, incredibly, fast growing country how can you deliver lots of homes to you know tackle housing crisis that we either have or you're going to have if you don't do this um, in the future um there's clearly a place for for towers in in cities um but we do know that you know they come with some downsides as well so for example the service charge in shakespeare tower is about eight thousand pounds a year most of that well sorry 11 percent of that goes on window cleaning um this is a lot more than you'd, you'd pay in um you know n normal homes where you could probably just do it yourself uh there's also some quite good research. This is from Professor Philip Stedman, who's um, does really good stuff at UCL, actually, uh, looking at the difference in energy use uh, and electricity and electricity use, fossil use and carbon emissions at different um, heights of buildings. A lot of this is to do with wind circulation patterns. When you have you know very high buildings, they need to then be um, either, I guess it depends what climate you're looking at, but they need to be warmed quite a lot. But also when you get lots of... Um, high buildings, you're not going to be able to open the windows to sort of let that natural ventilation in. Therefore, you're going to have to have a mechanical and technical solution to that. Um, so it's you know, worth worth showing where you get some really quite high energy uses when you go up to, uh, you know, greater than 20 stories. <coughs> um, I, I got into urban design because I was very interested in sustainability. Um, one of the, I think, missing factors of sustainability that we tend to see is um, almost like the denominator in the, in the equation, you know, how long is this place or this building being used for? Um, we could build a very, um, I sort of get very straight when I see passive house um, buildings out in like, I don't know, you know, middle of the countryside and there's like four Teslas outside and a big kind of asphalt driveway. And I don't think that if you did the you know whole, if you drew a control volume, I'm an engineer, sorry, if you drew a control volume around the whole of that and looked at the energy going in, I really don't think over the lifespan of that house, that it's going to be as sustainable as, you know, some of your um, seven story mansion box in, in, in the center of the city. Um, so one, one of the points here is if you build something beautiful, build something popular, build something that people who live there know and love, they're going to tend to reuse it. They're going to fight to reuse it. And I think you're more likely to see where well, you, you do see the telephone box on the left as that tech is kind of you know redundant now. That gets reused on the right. I think most people are campaigning to remove that because it's street clutter. Um, you know, here's an example of some factories that you know tend to be more likely to be repurposed. You see a lot of this in Manchester as well, some of the, the mills that get repurposed into, into uh, apartment blocks. Um, and I think there's a question here, will, will some of the towers like that be, be around in 100 years? I'm not too sure they will, to be honest. Um, on the other scale, you've got suburbs and you've got, um, I think, you know, there's lot, lots of critique of suburbs and I'm about to go on to do some of that. Uh, clearly, they're incredibly popular and it'd be foolish for us to just totally ignore why suburbs are very popular and why this type of single family home is very popular. 
uh, you know, lots of people, you know, the, the, the drivers of uh, value tends to be location, proximity to jobs and work and, and good transport um, and space. And obviously this delivers space and abundance um, and privacy as well. However, we know the downsides of this. We, we've, we've heard a couple of talks around connectivity and around transport. Um, if you do end up having the, the class curve and sprawl, you, you know, tend to drive three times as much. You're going to have more traffic accidents. Um, favorite stat here is if you commute over 45 minutes, you're 40% more likely to get divorced. Um, and the top 10 happiest nations have commutes under the global average. So um, I think reducing that commute is one of the things we can uh, do to increase people's happiness more than almost anything else actually in the urban environment. Um, in very tall blocks, it can uh, tend not to be good for you. Again, this is this is uh, evidence um, between 1962 and 2008. I don't know how much of this is also um, uh, from, from sort of India. I don't think much of it is. Uh, satisfaction with home tends to be um, quite high as, as a negative trend um, ar around sort of depression, children, crime, and social behavior. You tend to get correlations between that as well. Um, they can be very, you know, they, they can work very, very well for uh, professional couples or if you're single um, or living on your own, working, uh, you know, working professional, uh, professional jobs. Uh, this, so this is kind of why we've landed up the view around what we call gentle density, which is essentially, you know, high density, mid-rise, mid-rise home. So where you've got your terraces, um, mansion blocks, split level, maisonette terraces as well to deliver really high densities. Uh, and they can. So this is, you know, three ways of doing that. You've got very high rise, low coverage. So left, mid rise, medium coverage in the center and on the right, um, a sort of you know, classic Victorian terrace street. And these are all 75 dwellings per hectare. Um, I've kind of I've, I've shoehorned this one in here from a couple of talks I was doing on transport as well, because I do think the two go hand in hand, which is because we've seen such a sort of dominance of private vehicles coming into the city and coming to our urban areas, um, we've made room for them. Um, this is uh, Temple Circus in Bristol. Uh, you can see the open space has gone up 47%. So your planners are probably getting a really big tick. This is great news. We've got lots of new public space. It's in the center of a roundabout, but that sometimes doesn't seem to make a difference. Um, the carriageway space has gone up as well, 10%. Um, and to get the same number of homes as you would have in 1918 on the left there, you are going to have to build up. But then you get this common phenomenon, which you see, which is fast roads, wide roads, and tower blocks. Um, if we look at, and again, this is Europe, this is absolutely fantastic um, map uh, by Dan Cookson and Alistair Ray, uh, where they've essentially taken all of Europe, split it into one kilometre squares and looked at census data to look at the population. So you can go and sort of play around with, um, go and look at Spanish cities is my, or Spanish towns is my tip if you want to see amazing um, high density, you know, beautiful places. Uh, so L London is not very dense. Uh, if you look at its figures, the densest place uh, is, I think it's still made available as of the, the last census, uh, which is up around about 21,000 people um, per square kilometre. So Barcelona and Paris, you know, way up at sort of 52, 53. Uh, the second, in, interestingly, the second densest place, so I was looking at it on a um, sad Sunday afternoon, uh, was uh, East Ham, which uh, where they've got very tight, uh, and around about three-storey back-to-back um, Victorian terraced homes. Now, obviously, the, there may be lots of people sharing those and that, that could be a downside as well. But then Fulham was also very similar as well, where you've got lots of these terrace homes split into flats um, that actually work very well for, for people to live in and kind of flex depending on how much space they need. Um, and as I was saying, how we move around the city is determined by its density as well. You've got your sort of classic, here's your you know classic suburban sprawl, which um, is great, potentially a building and a space scale for people. But then uh, we, we've looked at some of the impacts on commuting it has on the on the left. Uh, and that kind of boils down to you know, density being one of the solutions to to climate change. It's absolutely fantastic uh, graph. I like to find it for some more places, actually. But I, I sort of you see it quite often for the East Coast of America, where you've got these, um, if you sort of zoomed in and, and looked in closely, you've got these pockets of green where you've got very, very low um, uh, carbon uh, CO2 equivalent emissions of green. And then they're surrounded by these swathes of red as the energy use you know, gets really, really quite high. And that's to do with you know, actually bigger homes that you're, you're heating more or cooling more. Uh, and then also the transport patterns, as, um, as Brian was talking about, you know, the incredibly stubborn, stuck at about 27% of our emissions for, um, for, for really quite a long time. Um, another negative impact, obviously, of that sprawl is, is air pollution. 
And I can imagine this isn't uh, an impact that's actually only more important in some of some of the Indian cities as well, to be honest, um, where, where you've got some some of the older vehicles. And it's not just about the environment. Uh, sorry, it's not just about the environment. It's also about the um, connectivity and it's about the human interaction as well. This is a very, um, it's Dominic Appleyard study, very sort of well cited. Uh, it was done a little while ago, but there was another one done in Bristol, I think in the 1980s, which pretty much said the same thing, which is you know, where you have heavily trafficked streets, and where you have these, you know, maybe tends to be higher, high rise um, housing and then very wide, fast roads. People don't tend to cross the road. You don't tend to have an interaction or a, um, those chance greetings or gatherings with people across the street. And even so sort of left and right of you. And as you go to the moderate traffic, you can see the number of friends, the number of kind of gathering, the power of the street corner tends to increase. And then finally, on light, light traffic, um, people tend to have far more acquaintances on that street and, and more friends. Um, so how can we make good streets? Uh, one of the key things is, you know, looking to mix it up. This is kind of one of our key rules is where you can mix things up. People use the, um, there's also been a lot of like kerfuffle around 50 minute cities, which I think is just 50 minute cities was a very good branding concept to say, have mixed use. Don't just have residential here and have, you know, your your jobs here and have your, um, your commercial, your leisure in different activities where you have to sort of travel to each one of them, you know. Make, mix it up vertically, have, have shops, have businesses, have offices on the ground floor, the first floor, and then have residential above and then have pockets of residential only, then, then work and residential and you know keep that all mixed up. And you're going to get much better space syntax scores actually where you um, you, you have much more sort of, uh, it's, you're going to have far more services within that kind of 10, 15, five minute walk of your, of your home. Um, care about the facade. This is something, you know, we're quite passionate about. Um, this is a, a happy city, project uh if you've read uh, city by charles montgomery's great book uh where he looked at uh volunteers posing as lost tourists on the left and on the right um and you can see the stats that on the left you know 10 percent of people offer to help outside the active facade whereas it's 2.2 on the passive um and i think an interesting one you know four times as many people actually led someone to their destination from the um the image on the left to the image on the right so we think this matters um we think color matters as well there's some good research around the effect of color on mood. This isn't as strong as some of the other um, some of the other sort of patterns um, in in improving facades, uh, but this is this is one from uh, the UK, Sweden, Saudi Arabia, and Argentina. It's a nice shot in Bristol. Uh, people do seem to prefer symmetry or near symmetry, and this doesn't have to be sort of every building symmetrical, but it can have a row of buildings that have a rhyme essentially, and um, they they have this you know phrase we like to use as coherent complexity. Um, you can see some examples here. Don't know if I have the image there, but one one um, on on symmetry. If you don't if you don't believe that as well, go and uh, when you're walking home, go and have a stop by a watch shop or try and have a look at a jewelers, and you'll see they put all the the two hands. I think it would be ten to two, so they they almost make this symmetrical, almost like a face in in shapes as well. So that's definitely a, one that the marketeers have kind of jumped onto. Um, we also did uh, in one of the books that, were, uh, that was produced at Streets and Squares, did some machine learning looking at, so it was one and a half million uh, ratings of over 200,000 images to try and understand, okay, what, what are the components that make places, um, we call it scenicness or popularity or beautiful, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we train this against, uh, we train the algorithm with some Ipsos Mori polling. Um, and it was, you know, here, here's some images of places that scored quite, quite low on the, out of five on the, on the, um, the grade. What's quite interesting is these quite a few of these had quite a high proportion of trees and it was in quite a high proportion of open space. And it was just trying to challenge that concept that statistically, if you have a lot of open space or a lot of public space and greenery, that is always a good thing. And what we're trying to argue is it matters much more how you structure this open space, how you structure the greenery. Um, and here's some of the uh, the images, clearly not out of five, actually must be an out of six, because uh, you've got Soho Square and Old Square up at 5.1. Um, but some of the factors you can see below that actually gave it the, the scores that the algorithm then you know, said this is a good place. And then when we tested with the polling, um, people agreed. Um, people tend to like smaller squares with more enclosure. So we're very interested in how can you get um, the kind of enclosure, you know, people talk about again down to like one-to-one -one or between, and when I talk about that, you know, the, the height of the buildings versus the the width of the streets, um, rather than getting, you know, too far away where you get sort of a, a, a typical suburban, maybe one to five, where you've got two stories up and then really quite a long um, quite a wide road parking, you know, front front of house parking verges, and um, really pushing places apart. And far more people preferred the small square rather than the large square. Uh, this is the piece on on symmetry and faces. Yeah, so this this is an interesting bit of research um, that Anne Sussman did. Um, I think she's American based, 
on faces and that people like to see faces in, in nature, but also in buildings as well, and they respond to it. And the, the hotspots here is um, essentially a pre-attentive cortex, so where, where your eyes dart to before you've sort of controlled them or decided where to look to. Um, and yeah, this is the point. You'll see all of these, yeah, I think it's uh, yeah, 10, uh, 10 past 10. So you've got this symmetrical face-like object in, in a lot of the, a lot of the watches. Um, I think that's pretty much it, and I hope I haven't run over too much. So yeah, you know, th this, by the way, this is the same urban block um, as this one. And, you know, we just want to encourage people to, you know, ask the questions, how do you feel? Where would you rather be? Let locals decide, you know, it's, it's not for us to decide. A lot of these examples have been, been European. Um, and I think these are, these are both European as well. Uh, but we would always encourage people to work with communities very much kind of at the, the plan making process, not just at the consulting process. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Shall I jump back and do questions later? Yes, let's yeah. do questions later. We've got two more speakers. So, um, Savini um, Rapitak, Rap, sorry, Rajapatska. There we go. Okay. <laughs> uh, from the Physics Foundation. Um, so, um, over to you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, I'll just close this because I'm not going to share slides. I'm just going to talk at you. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm an urban designer at the Princess Foundation. We are, um, there's a small team of us in the Princess Foundation. We are part of this projects team. Some of my colleagues are here today, actually. I'm um, so pleased to come and chat with us later if you'd like to. Um, and we, our, our team work on projects around the UK and the Commonwealth and the world, uh, around the world, championing and delivering sustainable urbanization. Um, and what's really interesting for us today, I mean, some brilliant presentations and so interesting to hear um, from so many great speakers today, but uh, it was absolutely fascinating to hear about the SCAD program in Toronto Valley and to hear from Charles about um, what they're doing there. And I'd quite like to go back to that conversation we were having um, following, that, following that presentation, because what we've been doing have very similar parallels of this sort of community-led, locally-led, um, bottom-up approach to responding and planning for the most pressing, difficult urban challenges that, um, that we face, and particularly cities in, um, in places like India will face in the future. Um, we have a, a project called the Rapid Planning Toolkit that we're developing at the Princess Foundation in partnership with um, a number of our Commonwealth partners. Uh, which is a bare bones guide, uh, a very simple, practical guide to implement um, planning that can be led by local local governments, local leaders um, in the global south to respond to rapid urbanization. Um, and the focus of this project is primarily to equip these um, these smaller uh, um, cities that have less capacity and less resource with the expertise and the cap and the capacity to plan. So just to explain a bit about the context of why we've produced this um, project and why we've created this program. Um, the fastest, we've identified that the fastest growing cities in the world globally are in Africa and Asia. Um, and in a number of these cities, um, the rate of urbanization uh, which we're measuring by the rate of population growth, but also the rate of growth of the urban extent of the city, so the urban footprint of the cities. They're growing in incredibly incredibly rapidly, um, sometimes exceeding 5%, where you have European cities that are growing at 1% to 2%. And what's quite alarming is the scale and the pace of growth that it's happening um, in so many cities in uh, the global south, so in Africa and Asia particularly, um, and also that it's happening extremely, extremely rapidly, which means that um, cities and countries and authorities are finding it really difficult to respond. Um, and there is a risk of missing these vital opportunities to create healthy, sustainable cities. So when we look at India, I mean, in fact, I, I mean, I'm not very familiar with India myself, but looking at the stats a little bit, we have, um, there are cities such as Korikoda in which you, I think it's known as Calicut sometimes as well. The urban extent of um, the city is growing as much as 15% per year. Um, 
the population growth of the city is only seven to eight percent, which means that to a certain degree, the city is also sprawling. Um, and then similarly in cities such as Balagam, Hindapur, Pune, Singrali, they're experiencing rates of population growth at three to four percent, but also growth in the urban footprints that exceeds seven percent. Um, so what this means is that in the next um, in the next 20, 30 years, these cities will see a rapid change in, you know, in the constitution, and there will be an enormous amount of growth that takes place. And even when you, even when you look at what's already happened, because India's seen a certain amount of um, urban boom, uh, urban growth, it, it, it's leading to quite a drastic change in in these cities. So we also have to consider that, according to the United Nations, by 2050, more of India's population will be living in cities than in rural areas. And while some of this rural to urban migration, which is gonna be fueling the growth of the cities, it, some of it will go into the mega cities, but quite a lot of it will also go into the 150 or so smaller cities, um, perhaps intermediary cities, or we sometimes call them secondary cities. Um, that, and, and it's these places that may face the biggest challenges to respond to urbanization because they have less capacity and resource in the form of architects, planners, and built environment professionals. And nor do they have the thoroughly developed planning frameworks and policies that would, would enable them to um, prepare a plan for how they might grow and adapt to this change. So um, the Princess Foundation, uh, well, our rapid planning toolkit, um, it, it meets this, it, it seeks to meet this need for um, a planning tool um, to, act, to establish a framework for sustainable growth and um, particularly responding to the critical lack of capacity in rapidly urbanizing Commonwealth towns and uh, intermediate cities. Uh, the thing to say about the toolkit is that the key is that it's about a rapid response and it's something that local leaders can implement. Um, and I will share some QR codes, but you can also go to our, our website, which is rapidplanningtoolkit.org. Uh, to have a look at it. Um, it. To summarize it, it's four simple steps. It's about getting stakeholders together, to, uh, stakeholders and communities together to create a charter, a vision for growth, something that the local people can endorse, um, making a plan for growth, uh, identifying areas that are suitable, um, implement, implementing, implementing the growth plan. So that means create um, protecting transport corridors, just protecting infrastructure routes and identifying um, natural assets or community uh, community assets and um, and then finally building the neighborhoods. So it sounds it sounds simple for uh, what is essentially quite a complex process. but um, we have piloted this project in a uh, in a town called Bo, um, or city called Bo, sorry, in Sierra Leone. Um, and that's quite recent. We did this project in 2020. And um, in Bo, the population of around 270,000 people is set to triple by 2040. So a team led by the local mayor and a, the planning officer implemented the steps of the toolkit. And um, they undertook a number of workshops uh, to engage the stakeholders in, and engage the community, um, forge this charter uh, that was endorsed by the locals and uh, understood that they needed to, to address some, um, some serious challenges. One of them being overdevelopment of uh, fragile wetlands, which was creating problems of sanitation, uh, poor health, and also you know, destroying ecosystems. So using the toolkit in just nine months, um, the city of Bo successfully secured buy-in and ownership of this growth plan um, with uh, communities, landowners and governments agreeing on this plan for growth and um, moving forward to protect blue and green corridors, uh, protect their wetlands and um, find key transport routes and spaces for community facilities. Um, what's what I find quite interesting about how they did how how they did this and what we advocate for is a um, again this community involvement um, and so 
uh, uh, one strategy is actually using tree planting. Now, I think you, you spoke a little bit earlier about how tree planting um, has been used in, in India as well and with SCAD to um, engage communities and in, involve the local people. And we found that in Bo, it's a, a very... Um, a very gentle way of identifying and marking routes, protecting sites and creating these, um, protecting the um, assets to stop development from taking over where it's not wanted. So um, we're also, we're also looking at implementing the toolkit in a, a village in Bangladesh called Kazagon. And this program is led uh, by a joint university program with Shah Jalal and uh, Birmingham University. And they've been undertaking similar workshops in the community. Now, that's uh, a much earlier project and um, they're, they're actually putting it together an exhibition at the building center uh, quite soon. But um, in addition to that, we're looking to kind of implement this further in um, uh, uh, well, in other cities in the Commonwealth that would appropriately make use of the toolkit to be able to allow local leaders to plan for, create a plan for the growth of their city. Um, and the way we're doing this is we've created a free online um, uh, set of activities that is hosted by the University College of Estate Management. Um, and it's essentially like a CPD. So anyone can log in. It's free, it's accessible, and you can do the course and you can do it uh, as an education course or an, as an implementation course. So that's whether you want to learn the process um, of, you know, a simplified process of how, uh, how a city might plan for growth or whether you want to be an implementer and actually uh, undertake this process for your city. So um, whilst we're still developing this in, looking for funding to be able to support more cities in this um it is available if you want to if you want to explore and if you if you want if, if it's um suitable for another city to take it forward we're very interested in hearing hearing from you and getting your thoughts on that um so those are the next step and that's a quick summary of the toolkit um i'll share these with you but please do ask any questions at the end if you have any we'll keep some time for questions <clears throat> we have thank you, thank you. We have our final speaker, um, Roxana Slavcheva um, from the Connected Places Task Force, who are looking at twinning with Indian and UK spaces. Thanks, David. Hello, everyone. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here, um, to be invited to speak, but also to to close what's been a really fascinating. Um, list of speakers and a uh, list of talks as well. Um, so just to give you a bit of background before I go into the specific programs that we do in India about who we are. Um, so some of you might have heard of Future Cities Catapult or other catapults. We're a network of, of nine actually set up by the UK government to advance a particular sector of the UK economy. Um, so for connected places, we're the result of the merger of a very kind of built environment focused one called Future Cities and then transport system. So we do everything that moves like literally from drones to railway to incentivizing, um, you know, more active modes of transport, uh, autonomous vehicles, just anything that really moves, we would do that. That's mobility, but anything that is also is stationary in the built environment and how we use places and how we approach that uh, design and kind of uh, experience for people going through places and place leadership um, is also another area that we focus on. So you see here, we're kind of a nonprofit. We don't have any kind of skin in the game in the sense that, you know, we we tend to produce a research and innovation and incentivize um, kind of the open markets and then uh, the UK economy to be able to produce a lot of the um, kind of the products and services um, to address certain urban challenges. Um, and we are a convener. So we work in partnership with all of those different um, actors. Um, and we're really looking into kind of collaboration and opening up as I said, kind of new markets, new opportunities um, to address uh, the biggest urban challenges. My role is to internationalize a lot of the expertise so similar to Arab, where we have experts in the built environment and mobility from kind of all um, sectors that you can think of all 
all fields. Um, we incorporate all of that kind of knowledge that we have in the UK um, and we work in partnership globally. So we are the UK's innovation and urban center and accelerator as well. Um, and we have certain, um, I guess, offers or certain programs that we have developed over the past few years, um, especially. Um, so I can walk you through it just to give you an example of some of the work that we do. Um, and we have this lens that you see here on the um, on the right hand side, which is really about, you know, what, what are our imperatives? What are we really kind of trying to solve and what are we trying to do? Um, and a lot of it is around kind of climate action, people's experience, um, but also about scaling and impact, which is something that we're really big on and, and being able to measure and prove kind of the, the concepts that we, we do through piloting. So one of the areas is city innovation twinning, which is something that we are developing in several countries and several cities with, with the UK counterparts. It's really about identifying the competitive um, edge, competitive advantage for each of those cities or particular places within those cities. So we'll go into that detail for India in particular, and then twinning. What can you actually learn from each other and how you can take partnership to the next level so you can create a pipeline of specific projects and opportunities that you can collaborate on. So it's really about kind of place leadership, but it's also about the specific sectors and projects and how to involve partners in the process to create something that is bigger than the sum of its parts. For net zero investment and implementation, we, so we build on a proprietary city typology tool that we have, and it's really about um, kind of looking into the innovation journey or the particular kind of net zero journey that each of the cities are taking. Um, so the likes of Dubai um, are going to be on a different journey than the likes of, um, you know, uh, Bangalore or, you know, London, and Singapore. So they're very different in the sense that although there are commonalities based around kind of urban challenges and growth and development, in terms of kind of where each innovation ecosystem sits that's kind of quite different and the different approaches to solve the challenges as well so it's really about kind of understanding you know how they can be matched up as well and how they can learn from each other um with an uh, specifically with a net zero lens which is a, a so to obviously the, the lens that applies to kind of all of our work. Um, in terms of uh, the third one, it's city challenges and open calls and pilots. This is uh, the one that I will focus on today in particular, um, because it's really our bread and butter, but it's also the really the, the way for us to be able to showcase whether it's a concept or a particular solution works. It's to test it small scale and then to understand whether that applies in the, the longer term and the longer kind of the bigger scale as well. Um, then we also have showcases and accelerator programs. Um, we do a lot around kind of roadmaps and strategy. So we've helped um, the Indian cities and their hundreds are 100 Smart Cities mission, for example, some seven or eight years ago. And it's really about taking that strategy and roadmap now and seeing how we can implement it. And that's the next stage we're at now after the funding from the national government for all of those smart cities uh, programs have dried out or run out. It's how do we work with the cities um, to be able to find a sustainable business model in order to kind of take that forward um, and implement some of those kind of uh, roadmap recommendations. And uh, we we also have a kind of a digital construction or um, BIM uh, building information modeling program internationally as well that we collaborate with partners on. Um, and it's really about kind of again, delivering on the smaller scale on the building side as well. So um, to give you an example of some of the piloting work that we've done, um, this is a, an award winning uh, program that we ran in partnership with other catapults as well. Um, and it's called Innovating for Clean Air. It's um, a program that wouldn't have been possible if we hadn't worked with the director of urban and land transport and the Indian Institute of Science. So we needed to have the local partners um, really fully committed to help us transform um, what is one of the busiest streets in Bengaluru, uh, which was our test site that we uh, we identified, and to create it into a clean air street. So the challenge we were given, um, and this is a UK government funded project, by the way, the challenge we were given by the city authority is there's a lot of congestion. There's, you know, obviously polluted air. It's something that, you know, cities around the world, but especially in India, are quite uh, known for, you know, suffering from. So what can we do that is both um, effective, that it it kind of, you know, obviously addresses the challenge, but it can also integrate some technology, some kind of uh, community um, enhancement and kind of benefits that can be reaped um, as well on the back of that intervention and how it can really hit the, what I call the, 
the triangle of happiness, which is really kind of the um, uh, how you know sustainable development really is defined, which is looking into the economic, environmental, and social aspects as well. So we created a challenge, an open call um, to UK and Indian partners um, to help us solve this challenge. Um, which is, you know, uh, polluted air in, in Bangalore. And what we got in return was all of those solutions, kind of behavioral kind of um, um, uh, services that could help incentivize people to change their behavior and kind of, you know, maybe um, produce kind of different uh, responses to kind of the, the congestion challenges. Also technologies, different kind of air sensors or including kind of wearable sensors. Um, and and we just kind of focused on the two tracks. So one was around air quality per se, so kind of around the measurement of it. And the other was around um, incentivizing people to use different modes of transport, so active modes of transport and uh, basically um, electric modes of transport will be low on emissions. Um, and so those are the companies that we collaborated with. We turned the test bed and we basically pedestrianized the street for a weekend. And this was during the pandemic. And it was hugely successful. It was it turned into a festival. So, again, it hit the three, the social, the economic and the environmental um, uh, impacts that we were hoping for in the sense that there were um, impact assessment studies um that took place um, and the air quality had improved as a result of the pedestrianization. Um, it also led to, um, uh, as a result of kind of, you know, people uh, not being allowed to have motorized um, modes of transit. So only kind of electric vehicles or active modes of transport were um, um, were available. And uh, there were also street vendors. There were people kind of interacting and using the space in a very different way, which kind of helped with the, helped with the kind of community aspect and the social aspects of there were well-being surveys being undertaken by uh by researchers on kind of how people use the space and their their kind of uh well-being had improved as a result of the change and um the economic aspect as as i mentioned you know street vendors and just more foot traffic actually um people using the space in a very different way as well um so this had proved um you know you might think that it's quite simple but in the sense we it took um, a lot of partners to make this happen we wouldn't have been able to do do so other Otherwise, it was really about creating kind of a partnership bridge between the technologies and the innovators, um, kind of the local innovation ecosystem that we sponsored through this pilot, um, both in the UK and the India side. It took a lot of kind of, you know, big corporates and um, some other international partners as well. Um, and so there were two small videos, which we can't play now. Um, but basically, this was taken in December of last year. And although the pilot ran its course, it was actually active for much more than a weekend. Um, so it was definitely seen as a, a beneficial um, kind of um, improvement to the uh, to the urban fabric um, and in particular place. Um, it is still used that way. So de facto, it continues to be used that way on Sundays, especially. And there's still a lot of kind of economic activity. Um, it's less uh, motorized traffic being used. And so there's a lot of questions that this kind of raises, and I'm sure there will be uh, some uh, questions from the audience around kind of, is this just diverting traffic? Is this kind of like a low, um, you know, like an LTN, similar to kind of other schemes we have, but it's really, it's, it's, it's a way for the city to reimagine how the space can be used differently. Um, what we found in India, especially, that it is very difficult for, for kind of authorities to, to think differently than, okay, we just need to build more highways. We just need to kind of, you know, really focus on the need, um, to, to kind of grow the city and the demand that is being put, um, you know, from, from kind of, you know, the, the citizens on, on using the space, um, to, for them to be able to kind of commute better. But, this gave them a sense to kind of envision um, the the reality of how the space can can be used um, differently, and that had opened up a lot of opportunities for them kind of think about then how the urban traffic and how to incentivize kind of more active transport can can change over time as well. What we're trying to do with a new pilot that we're launching um, is to do a similar kind of scheme where it's not so much focused on the pedestrianization aspect, but it's really more around um, again kind of similar schemes that exist already around kind of shared. Um, e-mobility, specifically focused on two-wheelers, which, as we've heard, is the predominant mode of transport in a lot of the Indian cities. And this can apply to big and small cities. It can apply to kind of uh, campus areas. It can apply to kind of very busy um, junctions as well. And we're not trying to replace, you know, public transport in, in, in 
Um, it's, it's in fact, it's the opposite. What we're trying to do is really help with the first and last mile connectivity. So we're looking into um, helping the city kind of, again, plan for its metro or plan for its kind of, you know, BRT, um, but then look into kind of where the gaps exist and could micro mobility help kind of achieve that, um, you know, uh, full kind of uh, mobility as a service and, and connectivity that they're um, striving for. Um, this is just kind of more around, you know, what the, the program is going to look like and how we're kind of planning to run it from a test bed perspective. We have identified kind of, you know, the location where we want to run it in. And the key here really is about kind of understanding what the barriers are around the sentiment of shared mobility. So uh, most um, most of these stakeholders that we interacted with in India warned us against, um, you know, sh being kind of too proactive on the shared side. Although, the, you know, electric vehicles are obviously becoming kind of more and more popular, there's policy really incentivizing kind of private uptake of, of electric vehicles. It is not what we're trying to achieve. We're really trying to kind of help the city plan um, with, um, with kind of a, a more sustainable um, mindset, which would help um, also kind of address a lot of the concerns around cleaning the energy grid and kind of batteries and, and uh, mining for those materials as well. If we all have fewer vehicles, then that would help solve a lot of the challenges we have around kind of electrification of those vehicles. Finally, um, as uh, mentioned initially around twinning. Um, so this, again, a lot of information is kind of given here but about place-based innovation twins and what that means. It is a concept we're still developing actually. Um, so we came uh, with the idea, we came up with the idea that there is a, a, a huge interest um, we have heard from kind of Indian cities, understanding what has gone well and where, you know, the lessons are learned from some of the development projects here in the UK. So we had interest from two cities like uh, Calcutta and Hyderabad in particular on some of the regeneration and kind of uh, innovation activities that have been happening in Manchester and in London. Um, and so we use those case studies as examples of kind of place leadership as a kind of overall like place approach to a certain area of development and then particular clusters that could be of interest um, to then share learnings uh, across the board. And, you know, likewise, the UK had been given a lot of really great examples from the Indian cities on how they're managing their kind of cultural heritage and kind of different regeneration strategies around that as well. Um, so what we're really trying to achieve through this kind of uh, partnership bridge and, and innovation uh, twinning approaches is uh, to be able to look into the assets that each uh, city and each place has. Um, so just to give an example, one of the uh, the partnerships we uncovered were around airports. So there's a particular airport in the UK that is, uh, you know, uh, it's basically net zero and there are several in India that would want to kind of you know exchange and learn from each other so again it's not kind of the first thing you think about when you when you think about kind of sister to the cities or you know this concept of twinning it's not necessarily a particular place or an airport that that comes to mind but those are the type of kind of um, really interesting projects that we're uncovering through through our work where we actually see that there's a lot of similarities, but at the same time, you know, different challenges, different capacities, different sort of approaches to how a net zero airport can, can take place. And that's just giving one example, but there's a lot of um, other ones that, uh, that again, we're, we're kind of uncovering through this process. Um, so just to, to, I guess, summarize everything <laughs> or to, to, to at least kind of kind of hammer in one point um talked a lot about kind of pilots and uh you know the importance of partnerships and specifically local partners of course um but i guess the the main point is um to always kind of keep in mind the larger scale to have like a really ambitious plan for how the city is going to develop and how to curb you know the uh the real kind of problems like sprawl and uh you, you know um just having kind of more cars on the road and building more highways um staying away from that but then um at the same time that is too big maybe a problem for a city that doesn't have, quite have the resources to answer all at once. So then to look into specific kind of more piecemeal solutions that can be tested and applied and then um, create the roadmap for how that can scale over time. And that's that's connected to places got a both in India. Thank you. I, I'm always torn as, uh, as chair thinking uh, we're running out of time, but also this is all really interesting and I want to hear more. So it's always that that tension. Um, so we we have run out of time, but we have the room for another 15 minutes. So with your agreement, if you're happy 
to take that 15 minutes as a question, questions, but also comments. I'm not, I'm always happy for people to say this is not as so much a question as a comment. I think that's fine. Um, but please, um, we've got the speakers all still here. If you want to ask a particular speaker a question, please do so. Um, otherwise, if you want to make a comment on what you've heard, um, please do. So who, who would like to go first? Robert at the back. Did you catch that, Brian? I, th I think the question was what happens when the consultation contradicts the what the computer says. Is that do people get data? Oh, do they get the information from the computer prior to the consultation? Yeah. Well, that is one of the great challenges the organs is to locate uh, the appropriate data. Um, and in preparing the workshops, uh, there's a lot of run up. <clears throat> and 50% of that run up, you're getting the right people in the group um, or <clears throat> connected to computers because it can be done remotely. Uh, but the other 50% of you're getting the right data. Uh, and yes, you do need both of those. Sorry, I should have switched the microphones on, which I now have done. Yeah. Further questions? Yes. Um, it's been really, really interesting listening to a lot of the speakers and uh, kind of my own journey as an urban designer at Princess Foundation and other organisations. But I've actually spent the last two years in India uh, working um, as leading for cities and now working in UN. Um, but one of the big things that haven't been discussed at all is around feasibility and investing. And actually, we've seen a lot of the plans that have been particularly in second cities, but we're not seeing how are those going to be invested. And so investment and how do you secure investment into impactful projects is a big challenge. And uh, the organization I work for, City Alliance, um, that's probably our biggest challenge, whether in uh, India or Africa. So investing is one thing that we haven't really discussed. The second thing is around governance. And, you know, governance is a big issue. So you may get the the government involved actually, but actually how do you give certainty, confidence, credibility to those projects so that they can be invested? Because, you know, public sector, we just don't have that sort of level of funds. But in addition to making sure about project viability, you need to look at impact and how do you measure impact? Because there are a lot of, um, not just private investors, but foundations and so on. And one of the things that we're doing to the Alliance is is actually looking at the project pipeline, and actually analysing them a lot more in terms of what are their impacts. How can we, you know, the criteria that we use to, to ensure viability, but also to match them intelligently to an investor or to a foundation or to a multinational zone. And I think we really need to bear that in mind when we come up with plans, because um, I'm an open sign, a planner, I'm building many, many projects. But actually, are they implementable? Are they feasible? Are they fundable? And I think we always need to think about that in addition with government. Both, both very good points. I don't know whether any of our speakers would like to address those points, whether what we're saying is the ideal, but it's actually unrealistic in terms of the local viability and governance in India. Sabini, were you, um, I think you were being looked at, whether, whether you wanted to. <laughs> um, so I, I think, the, I mean, just speaking on behalf of Foundation, which is um, rather than taking that top down approach, which does come into a lot of um, roadblocks because of governance and because of, I guess, maybe bureaucracy, but also the, um, the inability for, uh, you know, at a national, regional level to have the flexibility to adapt quickly to specific, uh, specific um, situations and specific challenges that are, you know, in um, many cities that are, you know, have big different challenge, different contexts and different challenges. That's that's why the tool, the toolkit, the, uh, the rapid planning toolkit, is specifically um, designed for local local yeah. level um, facilities. When we when we did this pilot project in Sierra Leone, um, I think it, some of the funding did come from from us as a uh, as a charity, as an organisation, to support them in order to do this process of stakeholder workshops and then um, some of the implementation um, and building works that, that is taking place. But I, I think that that 
funding thing is, is quite key. Um, ideally, ideally, I, I think what we what we try to acknowledge is the fact that in the global south, um, the lack of the lack of regulation or the lack of framework means that there needs to be a different approach. And sometimes the best the approach might come better when it is from within the community. Um, so, for instance, uh, we advocate this landowner workshops where you know, the um, the thinking is to engage engage landowners um, and uh, potential local investors in a vision or target for benefit of the community, for the benefit of the city, so that when if they are required to give something up or if they are required to um, you know for go. A small amount of land because you know that needs to be an like infrastructure connection or an arterial road. They can see that it is not just that they're not losing something, but they're gaining something from having a plan. And I've, I've got, I've got. I think, can I make a point? So I think it's the most fundamental question as an urban economist, I, I would obviously think that uh, we can only cover a limited subject in today, and it's been really looking at different techniques for. Of trying to get to success. But the whole other strand of our work has been on, on land value capture. And the real benefits of planning and development go into the increase in land values. So if you can control those, either by owning the land, which is going to benefit, or by getting a proportion of the increased value before the scheme has taken place, then you can get the investment back. It's crucially important, therefore, to not just think of planning as about a set of aspirations and targets, but to think about mobilizing resources in a bubble, getting hold of land before the value has been realized. Roxana wants to come in as well. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I completely agree with that. Obviously, it's about making smart planning um, and taking into the account of your economic sectors. Um, but just very, very good comments. So one is around. Um, the money is there, so it's not about the lack of finances. We all have, like every government I talk to, they, they don't say they don't have the money. They're just spending on different things and prioritizing it differently. Sometimes on building roads, and you build it on the okay. um, just because that's all that has been left in its legacy. And it's just really about kind of having you incentivizing them um, for them to, to think kind of differently and to approach. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's there's a lot of kind of vested interest politics. There's going to be a lot of, kind of pushbacks, obviously. It's, it's just kind of history repeating itself, but it's it's really about thinking um, differently. Um, then the second point was around, I mean, it's definitely going to be on game. How do you incentivize the investment in the right projects as well? And how do you make that sustainable? Um, so in the UK, um, the kind of the founding member of what's called now the um, 3CI or the, the triple, the Climate Change um, Investment Commission, say, um, it's changed me. Um, but it's basically really about kind of looking into um, helping UK cities, but then hopefully taking that model, once it's proven that it works, um, into other places, and, and looking into um, driving investment from the private sector um, with some seed funding from the public sector as well, um, into places rather than specific sectors. So as you know, it's important City Alliance and, and you know, other uh, big multilateral banks are very focused on big infrastructure projects, are very focused on let's fund this in a way, let's fund this transport, let's fund, you know, retrofitted buildings, and let's fund various particular sectors and never think about how is that place going to be um, looked at and used and what investment and what land value capture can, you know, actually be brought into this by using the place and all of those different Again, this is touching upon a lot of the presentations that we've heard about kind of, you know, good development uh, practices, but that's precisely the investment package and proposition that this particular kind of um, uh, commission is, is undertaking to, to think of it from kind of a place perspective, a city perspective, where investment is going to be driven and attracted, um, you know, in, in the right approach, rather than having a particular kind of... Um, uh, yeah, infrastructure. I mean, you know, there is so much money out there. Um, but, you know, and then people say, well, where are the projects? And there are so many projects out there. Problem is, are, are the projects in or are they impactful? Yeah. Um, and is the governance around that secure enough to get an investor in? And I think that's the, 
the biggest challenge. And we're working locally, you know, a, a, a little example is a project that we're doing in Uganda at the moment with um, seven secondary cities, um, where the very small cities just do not have the capacity to get the data that they need for a solid to waste energy project that we're doing. So we're now kind of focusing on one area um, to demonstrate that there is value in that project. Okay, I've got two more questions. We, we need to keep, at least two more questions, if not three. Let's let's make keep them quite brief and, and snappy so that we can get everyone in. So, gentlemen here, uh, well, both of you, both of you, I was going to come to. So, <laughs> yeah, there's talk about rapid urbanisation, and with that comes how you're building houses to accommodate these people, sustainable as well. And there's no talk about how the growth you are going to build. Those, and for my opinion. You could only do that through map, through MMC, modern methods of construction, to rapid growth. And what we're doing is we're working with the DIT in showing how to build, whether it's in Africa, North America. Uh, we just came back from doing a show in Dubai. We did the big five in Dubai in how we can build and train local community to build sustainably so that they, they support their own community, whether it's net zero or whatever. And I think that's the elephant in the room, is mm -hmm. how we're going to build sustainably and not use concrete in these up-and-coming um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gentleman behind you. So you, 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 me. Yeah, yeah, you had your hand up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a, bit, uh, a bit concerned about you saying there's lots of investment and so forth. Now, China has been pumping money into the, the, the so-called third world, right? And now they're being accused of, uh, you know, uh, basically holding up uh, these countries hostage, right? The West do not invest in the in the third world at all. The, the there's the World Bank, there's the AFC, there's all the development. Yeah, but then they charge them a fortune, which they can't yeah. afford yeah. to pay back. But you're right, you're absolutely right. And they're, they're focusing on the, in the big infrastructure projects because it's something tangible. They can say, we funded this highway and it's been funded by, you know, it's just, you know, they're the black right there. But because it's, it's you know, Helping them kind of move goods, and it's like the, the whole kind of like top you know, that, drives, that drives the economy. And then the economy, will, once the economy picks up, it, it spreads to the people. The infrastructure projects do help. Okay. But I think you've got the wrong approach completely. Dealing with small entities that like tiny little projects here and there is not going to help. You've got to have a coordinated uh, the approach here at all. I, I think there's there's no there's no overall vision here at all. I, I see everybody's presenting the same thing. I'm okay. not convinced at all. Not convinced. That, that, that lady over there with a the white jumper. Yeah. I had the opposite response. I thought it seems like the grassroots thing, the projects have clear impact. At least we're able to see the impact. The community they able to benefit from the impact. And I guess my question was. Um, in big city, in the smaller locations, the so smaller city, I grew up in Tamil Nadu, so you know, smaller cities um, or small, I guess, villages, the community exists and people are already invested in the community or they, they are, it's easier to engage them in placemaking activity. Whereas I wondered in urban spaces where most people are migrants, so I grew up in town, most people are coming from elsewhere, how do people get invested first in? You know, engaging in community building activities because then maybe your problem comes up, right? Because we don't know whether there's impact or not. Um, it's harder to coordinate these very large people from audience players. I just wondered how do we translate the success of grassroots in urban spaces? Which is a perennial problem for planning. <laughs> Since planning was invented, how did you combine major change with grassroots? Um, development. It's always been something which we've we've, we've sought to square. Um, we've, we're almost out of time. Uh, uh, Nick asked me to make some final comments, and I just wanted to make raise a couple of points in, in, in conclusion. Um, a, a few years ago, a few years ago, about 2017, um, I did a book with um, a, a friend um, in India, uh, Shruti Henami in in Jaipur, and as part of that, I went to Jaipur and spent a week at the architecture school in Jaipur doing a workshop. 
working out how to accommodate the growth of Jaipur. And one of the really interesting things that came up in those discussions, which is crucial to what we've been talking about today, is the extent to that we in the UK can tell India anything about urbanisation, because we messed up our cities pretty fundamentally. And by what right do we have to go over to anywhere and tell people how to plan a city? I know it's slightly on the mind for the whole purpose of the catapult process, but <laughs> nevertheless, it, it seemed to us that there was a major thing there. But then what became really interesting is we went around the centre of Jaipur, and I don't know if you know Jaipur, they have these beautiful Havali, which are these um, big mm-hmm. mansions that were built in the centre of, of Jaipur for the rich merchants, and they're all empty. And the old town of Jaipur is depopulated hugely as people suburbanise and sprawl. And someone said earlier, I think it was Savini, about the idea that the urban area of, of Indian cities is growing faster than the population. In other words, they're sprawling. They're doing exactly the same as, as we did in the UK. And, and I think this is a fundamental thing. And I think it was um, Glazier said in his book that if, um, if India and China urbanise in the same way as the US, the carbon footprint is goes up by 130%. And if they urbanise in the same way as France, it goes up by only 30%. So this is a crucial global issue. And the question, I think, from the discussion is whether the solutions that we've come up in the UK, inadequate as they are, are applicable in India. And what we came to that conclusion at Jaipur workshop was that they probably were, that we're all basically humans. We're all moving around, doing the same things, going to work and so on. And that the solutions that we've come up with and that David talked about from Create Streets actually do translate very often to other contexts. We need to be very careful about cultural appropriateness and understanding local context, but actually there is something universal here about the way we live together in a sustainable way. So I wanted to finish with that as a sort of final comment. We are exactly 6.15, so we are about to be ejected from this room. (laughs) Um, But thank you for all the speakers. It's been a fascinating and really interesting afternoon. Thank you for Charles come across from, from India and really inspiring conversations about what SCAD has been doing. And thank you all for coming to, to what's been a fantastic, fascinating event. Correspond, and thank you to the speakers for compressing a huge amount of material into an incredibly short space. We will try and produce a report. I'm delighted that the Urban Design Group, to whom we must ever be thankful, will be producing a video. Of, uh, they, they will be turning this into something manageable. I will be helping to try and summarize the results. But if any of you want to contribute more or help, we'd be only too glad because the whole idea was that it should be a two-way, from the very beginning, a two-way street, uh, an attempt to get people together around shared interests. And I hope if nothing else, we'd be, you've learned about some things which are, you didn't know about before, which are operating in a related field. Maybe we'll even get some collaboration and do what seems to work rather well in Indian villages at the city level. Thank you.